This week on Q&A, Huffington Post senior military correspondent David Wood discusses the 10-part series titled Beyond the Battlefield, which won him the 2012 Pulitzer Prize for national reporting. The series can be viewed online at HuffingtonPost.com. David Wood of the Huffington Post, what was your first reaction when you were told you won a Pulitzer Prize? I was totally shocked. I had no idea it was going to happen. I knew I'd written some good stuff, was very proud of it. The joy I get from and the deep satisfaction I get from this whole thing is in the writing. When I sit down to try to translate someone's reality onto paper, or in this case, digits, I guess, that creative process is it to me. And so when I heard that I'd won the prize, I was shocked and I guess I went a little numb. And, um, and it was deeply satisfying all over again. Is this the first time for a website to win a Pulitzer? It's the first time for a for-profit website to win a Pulitzer. So I believe um, there was a nonprofit journalism organization that won a Pulitzer last year, I think, uh, for public service. So what's your series about and how long was it? It was a 10-part series. <clears throat> it was about um, those men and women who are almost mortally injured in war, who because of the huge advances that have been made in medical trauma treatment over the last 10 years, now they're being saved. An incredible number of them are being saved. Almost everybody who falls on the battlefield is being saved. And I wanted to write about what life was like for these people. And I really started off with a question, having seen some people who were pretty, pretty gruesomely maimed, wouldn't it be better off if they were dead? Don't they wish that they were dead? I want to go to the caregivers first. Uh, Cheryl Genzer is the first one we have. We're going to see some video in a moment. Here's what you write. Amputees have a particularly hard time. It takes more than twice as much energy for a double amputee to walk with prosthetics and many choose a wheelchair instead, but without exercise, wheelchair users have a higher risk of obesity, diabetes, and heart disease. Talk about the caregiver and what they do with all this. Well, many of them are young. Uh, soldiers and Marines who go to war are young. They're 18, 19, 20. When they get married, their wives are 18, 19, and 20. And very often in cases that I came across, a couple would get married. A few months later, the husband would go off to war. And a few weeks after that, he'd come home swathed in bandages, tubes, um, and in a coma. And the young wife now, who's been married a few months to this person, is now in charge of taking care of that person for their lifetimes. I mean, imagine the, the shock, the grief, to see your loved one in that kind of condition, and then it's slowly dawning on you, you're gonna have to learn to take care of this person. You're gonna have to immediately learn to change dressings, to administer IVs, to uh, keep track of all the <clears throat> often dozens of different medications that your loved one is taking. It's an enormous responsibility, and it comes amid this intense grief and shock, and so the ones that I met are really strong people, and I, I came to just admire them so much. Cheryl Ganser is quoted in your piece as saying, we've all thought about it, says Cheryl. A strong, lively, and capable woman with an easy laugh and an ability to minimize the hard times. Most of the women have felt that way, that the only way out is to kill herself. It's such a burden. It can feel like such a burden. For one thing, um, understand that when your loved one is mortally wounded, or almost mortally wounded, gravely wounded, you don't have that person to talk to anymore. So you're really alone. And many of them come to a military hospital like Walter Reed, where they're surrounded by the best medical care in the world, I think. Um, 
extremely caring and understanding nurses and social workers and psychologists and you know as much care as we can think of to give them and yet they're still alone and often they're caring for small children as well so that's a sort of an added burden a and I have seen these young mostly young women bear up day after day after day in this terrible burden and at some point then they just go off and find a room and sit there with their head in their hands and weep because it's it's very very hard who is Cheryl Ganser and uh, who is Brian Ganser explain what his circumstances were. so Brian was a soldier um, he got blown up in uh, in Iraq an IED hit a vehicle he was in um, he didn't lose any limbs but he was pretty badly wounded um, his legs were shattered um, and he had that sort of indefinable thing that I call combat trauma which is you know if you're not specifically diagnosed with a traumatic brain injury or um, post-traumatic stress syndrome if you're not specifically diagnosed you can still have a range of symptoms and he does and they and they include depression, anxiety, um, not wanting to be in crowds. And, and But the thing that really struck me was he said, I just feel a little slow. And I said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, sort of mentally, I used to be a steak knife. Now I'm a butter knife. And I just thought, wow, you know, that, that really sums up what so many combat veterans are experiencing which is they're just not the same even if or as their physical wounds heal that mental trauma goes on continuing with uh, some of what you wrote inevitably Brian and Cheryl's frustration turned on each other Cheryl would prod him to be more active he would accuse her of trying to run his life he tried to wean himself off the drugs and became sick fights became more frequent at one point he tried to run her over with his car Another time he fled the house and disappeared with his guns. He returned hours later and again told Cheryl he wanted to commit suicide. At her wit's end, Cheryl told him that decision was up to him, but, quote, I wasn't going to help, unquote. He began crying and she held him. What were the circumstances there? Well, um, you know the stress that every married couple goes through. A couple where one of the one of them is severely wounded and is struggling with physical and mental wounds and the other partner is struggling with the burden of a caregiver. It's enormously stressful I, and I just can't imagine what Cheryl and Brian went through, are going through. Are they still together? Oh, they're still together. Oh, they're a great couple. I mean, they are wonderful, but like every couple, you know, they have fights, they have jealousies, they have misunderstandings, they have hurt feelings, and all that kind of is magnified by the stress that they're both under. So even in the case where we celebrate the wounded warriors, as we should, they appear at ball games and, and are feted at uh, Fourth of July celebrations and so forth. You know, behind the scenes on the off days, they're still struggling, and it's really hard. Here is uh, Cheryl Ganser <clears throat> on video. Caregivers often find that they also have the nightmares and emotional outbursts of PTSD. Psychotherapists now recognize this as secondary PTSD. The nightmares still continue three to four probably a night. You know, terrorist attacks and people being shot and um, cleaning other veterans' wounds. After the immediate, you know, time in the hospital, the undue stresses were caused by me more than anything. Just my attitude and my frustrations and she was the bear of all that. I took it out on her, unfortunately. Where do those folks live? <clears throat> uh, they live in Tennessee <clears throat> in a nice house. Um, they both have good jobs. Cheryl works for a, one of the nonprofit organizations that helps wounded warriors and their families and she's really good at it. I mean she really gets it. The thing that Brian's talking about there is something that I didn't mention and that is that the burden of being severely wounded 
falls on people who pride themselves on their athleticism, on their ability to, their stoicism really. I mean, these are really active, smart, aggressive, pushy, pushy in a good way, um, you know, fun-loving kids who get wounded. And now they're struggling with, in some cases, severe restrictions on what they can do. And I think that's what Brian was alluding to there, the incredible stress that he felt himself under that he took out on, on his wife. Here's another. Uh, excerpt, and it's a mother this time. Uh, the things I had to do for my child at 22 to 25, things you don't think you're ever going to do, she says. When, when you have to wipe his bottom, hold him up in the shower, wash his privates, and things people can't comprehend, it does create an intimacy between you two, but it's damaging. That's not what your adult male child wants his mother to be doing. Who's that? It was the mother of Scott Stevenson. Uh, who was also in the Army and was uh, blown up by an IED, a roadside bomb. Um, lost a leg, a lot of other damage, heavy burns. He was pretty badly wounded. He was taken to um, Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio. Um, they called his mother. She came down and stayed with him for months. Um, and as she says, it's a very awkward position for a mother to be in, to be caring for your son. I can't remember how old he was here. I think he was 21 or 22. And a big guy. He's a big guy. To be caring for him like an infant, very difficult, you know, physically and, 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 and mentally because you know that his life is in your hands. You have to change the dressings. It's a procedure that can take hours and hours, especially for burn patients critical that no infection be allowed to set in. And it's the caregivers who change the dressings in the morning and at night. And she did that for months. And I asked her once, I said, how do you do that? She said, well, you do it because you have to. But she also said, I told the Army, I gave you my son in the best physical condition of his life and you returned him like this. I'm going to get what I need from you, and I'm going to make sure I do, and don't you forget it. And she was really strong and tough, really good person. How did you pick these folks, and how many did you uh, highlight in your series? Well, let's see. I, I talked to dozens of them, and I ended up focusing on those who I thought could tell the story the best. Um, I started at Walter Reed in the amputee center. And um, the Marines there who were in charge basically said, you know, talk to anybody you want to. And so I picked this one young man who was working out pretty aggressively. He stopped. We talked. Uh, I ended up interviewing him probably 10 times. Who was he? Tyler Southern, uh, who lost both legs and one arm in Afghanistan, stepped on an IED. Just a wonderfully irrepressible young American. What a hero. Um, a, a good person, a deeply good person. Funny, fun to be around. Um, and it took me a long time to sort of break through that um, sort of bravado. Uh, but I finally did. And um, he was the subject of the first piece I wrote because he, to me, came to embody everything that these young Americans go through, the pride of service, the incredible camaraderie with his combat, combat um, brethren, uh, and then abruptly waking up with no legs and only one arm, and what that process is like. Can you take us from the beginning on that? Where was he exactly? <clears throat> he was a... in a place called Sangin in Afghanistan. It's in Helmand province. Um, they were on a patrol. It was a pl pl platoon patrol, so you know, 20, 25 guys, Marines. They split up to go around the side of a house 
the medic who, or uh, Navy corpsman who was with them went one way, Tyler went the other way. The Navy corpsman told me he heard the explosion. I said to Tyler, what was that like? He said, you know, I don't, I remember going out on patrol and the next thing I woke up in Walter Reed, or Bethesda, I guess he was. So he doesn't remember anything about it. What happened was that he, as I pieced the story together, um, there was, they were taking fire from a little cluster of houses, so they approached very carefully and went around the side and um, whoever was inside the insurgents had fled, but they'd peppered the ground with IEDs and Tyler stepped on one and it blew a little crater in the ground and when the corpsman, James Stoddard, raced around the side of the buildings to get to him, he was just lying there in this sort of smoking crater and for the Navy corpsman, James Stoddard, 19 years old, his first combat patrol, his first time in Afghanistan and never treated a live casualty. So I said, well, what was that like? I mean, here's your, you know, your good buddy, Tyler Southern, lying there almost dead. He said, I have no idea. I, I don't know what I thought. I just, you know, muscle memory kicked in. And the incredible training that these guys go through, where they respond to emergencies like that over and over and over and over again at nighttime, in the dark, in the rain, in the cold, in the heat, over and over and over again. So that when it came time for his first, his first outing as a combat corpsman, he did it. He got on three tourniquets on the stumps, checked his airway, did all the right things, got an IV in him, and while the Marines were calling in a medevac helicopter, which eventually came and took him away. When did he first know that he had lost two limbs, three limbs? When he woke up, uh, I think it was 12 days later, at Bethesda, his parents were there around the bed. He was in a medically induced coma, of course. His heart had stopped twice in the time between when the helicopter picked him up and when he got to Bethesda. The doctors had performed uh, a real sort of Hail Mary operation in which they slid open the side of his chest and reach in and clamp off all the blood vessels carrying blood everywhere except to his brain because they wanted to keep the brain alive, everything else they could deal with. And it's apparently an operation that usually fails. It saved his life. So he eventually came out of his coma. The doctors were trying to say, Tyler, Tyler Southern, wake up and no response. And they tried everything, couldn't get a response. He should have been awake because they'd taken the medication off. And his mother at the foot of the bed said, Tyler, say hello to your mama. And his eyes fluttered and he said, hello, mama. So that's how he came awake. Later that day, she said, do you know what happened to you? And he said, no. And she, she said, you lost both of your legs and one of your arms. And he said, okay, you know, we'll go on from here. Did you ask him about that? I did. Because he said, he said, uh, you know, whatever, what's on TV? And it was deeper into our relationship when I said, okay, so you told me once that when you heard you lost both your legs and an arm, it didn't really bother you. I said, really? And so he talked about that. And what he told me was so human and so understandable. He said, look, I've always been the smallest person in the family. I've got two big brothers. My dad is big and, and capable. Both his brothers are in the military. And he said, I didn't want to do anything that would make me seem lesser in their eyes. And so I knew I had to really step up to this and power through it and be strong. And so I was. Where is he today? Wow. I saw him the other day at Walter Reed Hospital. He's, um, he's still having um, operations on his remaining arm, much of which was torn away. 
Um, and um, he's he and his wife, he got married. He and his wife have a house in Florida, and I think they'll probably move there once he's finished it. Did he know his yeah. wife before he got into the, uh, no. the situation? No. He was, well, he did. He, he went to high school with her, and he always wanted to ask her out, but didn't dare because she was the prettiest girl, and he didn't think he had a chance. And um, after he was wounded, his mom ran into her um, in Florida, and she said, you know, how's Tyler? And his mother said, oh, you know, he was badly injured. And she said, well, I kind of like to go see him. So they went together back up to uh, Bethesda, and she walked in the room and saw Tyler, and apparently that was it. They fell in love, and she stayed on as his caregiver, and then they got married. Some statistics. I got these this morning on iCasualties.org. Uh, in Iraq, we've lost 400. 4,486 to death in Afghanistan, 2,028, making it 6,514. In Iraq, we had 22,516 wounded. Afghan, Afghanistan, 10,369 for a total of 32,885 wounded. You say you have a figure in your stories about how many have been seriously wounded. What is that? It's about, uh, you know, nobody really knows. That's the really disturbing thing about this is that between the Defense Department's database and the Department of Veterans Affairs database, there's a lot of overlap and discrepancy. So if you want to know how many amputees there have been, you can't get a good number. Even they can't get a good number. The other problem is that when somebody's wounded on the battlefield, um, the Combat corpsmen and medics are so busy trying to save him, and there's usually a firefight going on, so it's chaotic. A lot of smoke, a lot of noise, a lot of confusion, nobody's sure what's going on. It's very, very difficult, and what the Defense Department asks is that somebody sit down and fill out a form and file it. Well, guess what? It doesn't always get done accurately, and so there's really no really good count, but I figure between you know trying to put everything together about 15,000 young American men and women have been catastrophically wounded that is it, 10 years ago in combat they probably would have died in, in on the battlefield but now they're being saved you say that there are four out of these wars that have lost all four limbs at least and there's probably more what did they do not what to, you know. What is the <clears throat> how do the, the veterans association or, uh, organization and the all the how do they take care of somebody like that? And how, what happens to the heads of these four people or at least or more that have lost all their limbs? I can't speak for them. I don't know what goes on deep inside. I've only met one of the quadruples, as they call themselves. Um, got artificial arms. Prosthetic arms, prosthetic legs. He can get up and walk and um, and get around. You know, we look on these people as heroes, and we think, okay, so he's got prosthetic legs and arms. He's he's good to go. It takes an enormous amount of energy, uh, as you alluded to, to operate those. The the prosthetic arms, for example, are powered and they're smart. They have computers built in, and um, but to, but to operate them, you've got to twitch your shoulder muscle in a certain way. And so when you see someone with a prosthetic arm pick up a glass of water and drink from it, it's an enormous achievement and takes a lot of time and concentration and training to be able to do that. So that the, so that the quadruples or even a triple like um, Tyler Southern, and that's the way they refer to them. Tyler says, I'm a triple. A tr meaning a triple amputee. Um, they can live pretty good lives, but it's always a struggle. And the long-term consequences, we don't know about. For example, um, one thing they know from the Vietnam generation of amputees is that people who are fitted with prosthetic legs, for example, can walk okay. But eventually, it's too much trouble, too difficult, too hard, too demanding, and they, they go back to a wheelchair. 
it's not known what long-term health consequences stem from that, either being in a wheelchair or using the prosthetic limbs, because we just don't have that experience. In the middle of one of your pieces, you tell us that the head of the Veterans Administration is Eric Shinseki, former Chief of Staff of the Army, but he wouldn't talk to you, but he has lost one of his feet. Mm -hmm. How did he do that? He was blown off in, by a landmine in, um, in Vietnam. He was a combat infantryman in Vietnam. Uh, an enormously capable guy, rose to be Army Chief of Staff, uh, was famously dismissed by um, Defense Secretary Rumsfeld for accurately predicting how many troops it would take to fight the war in Iraq. Uh, was named to be uh, the head of the Veterans Administration or the Department of Veterans Affairs by President Obama has done enormously good work. And the reason why I didn't quote him or interview him for this series is just simply one of timing. We couldn't, we couldn't make that work. Um, but it, everywhere I go, every veteran I talk to, every VA psychiatrist or, or PTSD therapist or housing person or, I mean, you see Secretary Shinseki's hand everywhere. And it's always a personal touch. Um, for example, I talked to um, some VA officials in Philadelphia who run the housing program up there where they're getting veterans, homeless veterans into housing. And um, uh, the Secretary Shinseki met with them, with these officials, and he wanted to know the personal stories of people who were still homeless. And why are they still homeless? And what are their names? And what are their pictures? I want to know what they look like. A very direct personal thing, which I think is, is paying off as the VA becomes much more efficient and effective and, and extends its services to more and more veterans who are demanding more and more services. For those that want to read this 10-part series, they go on the HuffingtonPost.com? That's correct. And then how do they find it? Um, the easiest way is to Google either me, David Wood, or the name of the series is Beyond the Battlefield. So if you go on HuffingtonPost.com uh, and search for Beyond the Battlefield, you'll find it pretty easy. Can you download it as an ebook? Yes, it is an ebook also. Uh, in fact, we expanded it a bit. There's a couple of extra chapters. I wrote a whole chapter on courage, mostly writing about the caregivers because it seemed like such a central concept that I wanted to just talk about courage. Here's some video, uh, and video is associated with all of this on the oh, yes. Huffington Post site, of Army Staff Sergeant Todd M. Nelson. Let's watch. Here at the Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas, surgeons, rehab specialists, and researchers are doing everything they can to deal with these deep injuries helping soldiers heal, and finding new ways to help restore their function. My main thing was function, and then if I had any room left over for, for more, it would go into form. I wanted my eyelids to close, I wanted to be able to breathe through my nose, and I wanted to be able to eat a good-sized hamburger, too. What happened to Todd Nelson? Todd Nelson was um, serving in the Army in Afghanistan, I'm sorry, in Iraq, um, was riding in a unarmored vehicle uh, through, through the city and um, he drove past a suicide bomber who detonate, detonated his vehicle full of explosives and shrapnel as Todd passed. Todd was sitting in the right front passenger seat. This is downtown Kabul. Yes. He's in a SUV and there was a Toyota, white Toyota, you say? That's right. By? Yeah. Uh, it, he was in a, Todd was in an army convoy. They were taking stuff back and forth and just simply because of the need for armor out in the field, um, there weren't enough armored vehicles for him to ride in so they were just using a regular SUV. And when this uh, white Toyota Corolla exploded, it tore off the side of the truck that Todd was riding in and catastrophically burned him even under his helmet 
burned off all the skin and off his skull. His head was literally on fire along with much of the rest of him. And of course, the blast damage tore off his face, basically. Somehow he survived. I have not met anybody who could explain to me how you could survive something like that. It has something to do with an incredible will to live. Uh, so they evacuated him from Kabul back through Germany at the big U.S. military hospital in Landstuhl, which is the first stop for severely injured coming out of In Germany? Yeah. Uh, at that point, the doctors make a decision, is this person going to die? And if so, we'll get his wife here. If we, can say, if we can keep him alive for another day or two, let's send him on. So they sent him on to uh, Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas, where the Army has its burn center, which is an amazing place. Uh, they got him there and they began years of very painful rehabilitation and treatment. And this happened when? Boy, I don't remember. I think it was 2007, perhaps. And Can he see? Yes. He both has one good eye, eye. One, one, good one eye, one eye, one, art, one glass eye. Um, is he married? You know what survived is his wit and his um, incredible sensitivity to other human beings, his faith. Everything else is a little battered. His face is battered. He has an artificial ear. It's attached with a magnet to a metal plate in his skull. And he told me he worries about sometimes that he'll, he worries that he'll lose it, that it'll fall off and he won't notice. Um, he's had pa many, many, many dozens of painful skin grafts on his face. Skin grafts are, are hard because they scar. And you know when you have a scar, it becomes hard and lumpy and, 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 and irregular, jagged, not smooth, and, and not flexible. So if your entire face is covered with skin grafts, um, it's, it's painful and your face doesn't work well. You can't smile really well. You can't yawn. You can't stretch your eyes. You can't make facial expressions. And so the doctors at Brook Army Medical Center are the, the best in the world. The Army, it turns out, has done or funded all of the full face transplants done in the United States, and I think there have been seven. Really done a lot of research and cutting edge surgical techniques, trying to figure out how to do better facial reconstruction. There have been some big breakthroughs since Todd went through those operations, and most of his face is skin grafts and you know, it's okay, he can function, but it's not pretty. Does he have a job? He, the last I spoke to him, he was trying to decide what to do with the rest of his life, and that's a pretty big decision. He's a very religious guy, and I think that he was heading in the direction of being a motivational speecher, speaker and working in a nonprofit to help other veterans. You write, uh, Todd had been married just six months before he deployed to Afghanistan. He was blown up 45 days before the end of his second one-year combat tour. It was his second marriage. His first broke apart during the first combat tour in Iraq. His second wife, Sarah, was born with one leg and walks with a prosthesis, which has made for some interesting encounters. At a movie theater recently, the young lad taking the tickets stared at her leg, then at Todd's face. What, what, what happened? <laughs> he gasped. <laughs> They both laughed uproariously telling me this story. Um, like many of the severely wounded who survive, they seem to have a huge appetite for life, a big sense of humor. They're fun people to be around. They have children. They do not. Um, Todd has children from his former marriage. I think they're mostly grown now. Um, Sarah grew up on a farm. 
I think until this happened, you would not have called her a terrifically strong person. But when this happened, she became that strong person. Here's some video of Robert, Dr. Robert Hale from the San Antonio yeah. Burn Center. Among the most gruesome and painful wounds are burns. IEDs explode in a fireball of 2,700 degrees, often crushing faces and then burning off skin, ears, nose, eyelids. The story of skin really is, is, is two stories. One is the story of trying to save a life and close your skin rapidly and then to, to regenerate high quality skin for those very important functional body parts like the face. What's that burn center like? I'm smiling just because I'm remembering a story he told me. This is a good example, Brian, of the kind of people that we have working in the military medical center. If I could just divert sure. from your question sure. for a second. Um, a very successful uh, plastic surgeon in Los Angeles, uh, Bob Hale, was in the Army Reserves because the Army had paid for him to go to medical school and so he owed them some time. And he got activated and sent to Iraq where he started treating the severely wounded. After he'd been there a couple of weeks, he called his wife. He said, sell my practice. I'm staying here. An enormously lucrative practice, and you, as you can imagine, a plastic surgeon, surgeon in Los Angeles. Um, and he has dedicated his life now to basically helping people like Todd Nelson um, recover full function of their, of their faces. How big is that burn center in San Antonio? It's not very big. I was surprised. I think it's one floor of the hospital. But what's interesting is the first thing that struck me is that it's warm. It's very warm. And it's because burn patients don't have skin and therefore they don't, there's, there's nothing to prevent their bodies from losing body heat and so they have to keep it fairly warm. The first thing they do is to take them into the shower room, which is a, a big tiled, yellow tiled room uh, with gentle warm water and they have to wash away the charred flesh. Um, and, and from there, there are very specialized kind of treatment facilities that so that the surgeons can work on repairing damaged bones. For example, Todd's face was crushed. And so they had to replace part of his jaw. They had to rebuild his cheekbones and his uh, occipital, occipital um, or part around his eye. And, and all that had to be done while they're treating the, the burn itself. When the, uh, oh, I don't know, the veil comes down eventually as you're talking to them, uh, what do they tell you when they're honest about the war? That's not to guess that they're not that they're dishonest about. What do they say though when they when there's nobody watching? They'd all do it over again. You know, there's something that drives them to this ideal of service and the you know, it's like so many people I know who served in war is that that the intensity of the experience, the intensity of the relationships they have with their combat buddies are so strong and so pure and true that they look back on those times with longing. And so I'd always ask them, you know, do you wish this had never happened? Do you, you know, and they're like, I'd do it again in a heartbeat. I think there's something else that goes on there too, and it is that going through a near-death experience somehow seems to give them so much strength and courage and optimism that I think that that's one reason why they would do it again. Now, there are some who don't do so well. Drug addiction is so common among the severely wounded because they, you know, they get on these drugs and very often early on in their treatment, I've found uh, they are in some sense over medicated. 
um, is what I've heard from a lot of military doctors and, and therapists and nurses. And, and so, you know, many of them do get addicted to drugs. It's a very hard thing to break, especially when, as in the case of Brian Gansner, for example, he's in a military hospital for, I forget what it is, a year, 14 months, something like that, and then he's sent home. Well, once you're out of that military cocoon, you've got nobody who really understands what you went through. You're more or less on your own. You're thrown back into the civilian workforce. You've got to work for a boss who doesn't understand what combat was like in Iraq, doesn't really appreciate, can't really appreciate what it takes for a guy like Sergeant Brian Gansner to, to operate in a war zone, to keep his guys safe. If I remember right, all these people that you wrote about were enlisted men. That's right. Officers very often get wounded, lose arms and legs. Well, sure they do. Uh, you know, there, <laughs> there's a lot more enlisted people than officers. And, um, and it, you know, in the case of uh, Tyler Southern, for example, a Marine, most of the Marines who get wounded in Afghanistan are enlisted guys because they're out doing the patrols. So in a sense, they're more vulnerable. Some more video of a man named Bobby Henline. Let's watch. And if I continue to do this, and I help people the rest of my life, and I've helped better them, then that's the best revenge I can get on this guy that did this to me and my buddies because I will help more people than he will ever hurt. Bobby Henline's experiences raise a question that many of those badly wounded in combat wonder as they begin to recover. Why did I survive? For what purpose? Read how he found the answer in the story that follows. You know, people always say, I don't know how to think the vets. What do I do? What do I do? Live your life to the fullest. Do what I'm doing. Chase your dreams. You know, there's no reason to stop. What's his story? Uh, Bobby Headline, 82nd Airborne Sergeant, uh, blown up in Iraq, um, was a Humvee, five guys in it, four of them were killed instantly. Bobby rolled out on fire. Again, uh, there's no explanation as to how he survived, he just did. He of course, was rushed to the hospital, fl flown back through Landstuhl and back to Brook Army Medical Center in San Antonio, to the Army Burn Center. Was in surgeries and, you know, just a long, difficult, painful um, recovery. But he did recover. Uh, you can see his face is mostly a mass of scars from um, skin grafts. He came out of that experience wondering, what am I supposed to do with my life? Because four of my buddies were killed and I was saved. He said, I'm not a terribly religious guy, but I started to get the feeling God reached down and said, you're going to survive and you're going to do something meaningful. But he didn't tell me what it was, he said. So he eventually found stand-up comedy as a way to bridge the gap between the wounded and the unwounded. This is so common, Brian. I see this all the time. We see it around Washington because of Walter Reed. There's a lot of wounded soldiers around here and guys with prosthetics and we see them on the, on the metro. And people don't know how to react to them. It, it's, it's kind of awkward. A lot of times people will just avert their eyes. Well, it's, it's, it's awkward. And even I was awkward at first, not knowing, should I stare at this person? Should I say hello? Should I avert my eyes? Do they want me to, to notice them or what? And, and, and what Bobby Henline found out and what I found out from other wounded service people is that they do want to be noticed. They want you to ask, hey, what happened? Bobby, Bobby Henline told me he walked into a hospital waiting room one time and there was a guy in there watering the plants 
And the guy just was shocked. He dropped the watering can and he said, Jesus, what happened to you? And Bobby said, I just burst out laughing because it was such a human response. And the thing that I learned was that the wounded view their wounds and their scars and their missing limbs as, as medals that they won in service. And they're proud and they want to be recognized. In a minute, I'm going to show some video of you from 1988. When oh you dear. appeared here on uh, <clears throat> C-SPAN when you were, we were doing those call-in shows. Um, before I get there, though, where's hometown originally? I grew up in Port Washington, Long Island, New York, suburban town. What was, I saw somewhere where your family was a Quaker. Were you a Quaker? I grew up in a Quaker family. We went to Quaker meeting every Sunday, and I learned to be a pacifist. And uh, when it came time, uh, when I got to be 18, I declared myself a conscientious objector. And I eventually did two years of civilian service instead of going in the military. Where did you do that? In Philadelphia. I worked for a Quaker rehabilitation service. And what about school? Where did you start journalism? Well, I had kind of a checkered career. I started off at Allegheny College. Um, we parted ways in my junior year. Um, then I got drafted, did my two years of civilian service. Uh, while I went to night school, I eventually graduated from Temple University uh, with a 4.0 average <clears throat> and um, got my first job working as a stringer for Time Magazine. In my old school, that would have been four out of six, so I want to make sure it was a four <laughs> point out of four. <laughs> it was four out of four. Um, are you required if you're a conscientious objector to do public service like that? The way that worked, uh, and this was early in the Vietnam War, so this was 1965 and 6. Um, it was before any draft cards had been burned. And the deal was that if the local draft board approved your application to be a conscientious objector, then you had to go find a job, a civilian job that they approved of. So I found a job working for this Quaker organization in Vietnam. And they said, oh, no, you can't go to Vietnam. That's too far away. I said, but you're sending everybody else to Vietnam. And they said, no. So that's why I ended up working in Philadelphia. How many different battles have you been in as an embed reporter? Oh, gosh, I have no idea. You know, I started in 1977. I went to um, Africa as Time Magazine bureau chief. And mostly what I wrote about was war. And um, I had no preparation for it at all. It never occurred to me or anyone else, you know, if we send Dave Wood in to, you know, to cover these guerrilla wars, we might want to give him a little training, <laughs> at least some first aid, something. No, nothing. Um, so I sort of learned on the fly and was very lucky that I never got wounded or even, you know, was in any really serious peril. Um, and then I came back to the United States in 1980 and started covering the Pentagon and soon found out that you could go out to the field with the Army and the Marines. And that was a lot more fun than covering the Pentagon. So I spent pretty much the 1980s and 1990s either out in the field with the military or going on what were then the military interventions and went to Panama and went to uh, Bosnia and um, Desert Storm, of course. And um, so by the time 9-11 came, I had a lot of field time. And not only had I a lot of field time, I had a lot of, I had a lot of combat time as a bystander, usually as a terrified bystander. And so it was a little uncomfortable because a lot of guys in the military had no exposure to war and they would ask me sometimes what's it like you know <laughs> and and I'd have to say look I'm not a soldier I don't participate in war I just I just watch it happen and write about it um, but then of course 9-11 came we went to Afghanistan and then Iraq and 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 pretty soon we have a whole generation of really combat hardened veterans different organizations you've worked for uh, Time Magazine when I was in Africa, then I worked at the Washington Star here in Washington for a year before it collapsed, then I went to the LA Times, covered the Pentagon for them, traveled around the world, had a great time, 
worked for Newhouse News Service here in Washington, which was a small newspaper wire service, a great job. Um, then it folded and I went to the Baltimore Sun and then they laid me off when they were closing the Washington Bureau. So uh, I went to uh, AOL, worked for a little website there called Politics Daily and then when it merged with the Huffington Post, I went to the Huffington Post. How many years ago with the Huffington Post did you go? A year and a half ago. Here you are in 1988. Oh dear. Here's the Los Angeles Times from Thursday and the lead story by uh, Jack Nelson, the bureau chief, and I think Ron Ostro is in this one. I can't see it until it gets close. Yeah, it is Ron Ostro. Effort launched to oust CIA chief intelligence veterans call Webster too cautious on covert operations. Have you seen any of this, Dave? I sure have, yeah. There's a, there's a, uh, a growing sense in the intelligence community that we may have thrown the baby out with the bathwater as we went particularly through the Iran-Contra affair when, uh, when covert operations um, um, were exposed uh, that had gone very much awry and out of control. Um, intelligence professionals insist, and I think with some justification, that a country like the United States has got to be able to do things in the international arena without acknowledging them. There you are, and there you are. <laughs> uh, I don't know why we do this. We do it all the time. <laughs> you can see, I mean, I have the same problem. I can see what it was like all those years ago. Any reaction to uh, Dave Wood of those days? You know, I sounded pretty authoritarian, authoritative, <laughs> and um, and it's always been fun. C-SPAN has been a good a good place for me and, and a comfortable home, and I'm always happy to come on. What's it like to get? Is, is this your first Pulitzer Prize? Yes. What's it like? What you know? We see from now on in your life, you'll be referred to as the Pulitzer Prize winning Dave Wood. Well, it's a stunning honor, and. Um, when you win the Pulitzer Prize, you go to a luncheon in New York at Columbia University, which gives the prize, and the luncheon's held in the library, which is a, a huge marble, ornate, domed building. You can sort of feel the weight of history there, and of course, the room is full of previous Pulitzer Prize winners. Just you know, the cream of American arts and letters and journalism, because there's also a Pulitzer Prize for poetry and, and, and fiction and nonfiction and history and so forth. And so tremendously accomplished people. And I, I sat at a table with um, a, a, an Afghan photographer who'd won for spot photography and his photo, I'm sure you've seen it, is a, there was a wedding, a suicide bomber, carnage and in the middle of a young girl standing up just sobbing. It was such a powerful uh, photograph. And he, I said to him at some point, this is a great honor for you. And he said, no, 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 no. This is a great honor for South Asian journalists because it shows we compete in the same world as you do. And so this is for all of us. It was very moving. Did you get any reaction out of any of your subjects in the story? Oh, they were all delighted. They were like, yay. <laughs> I mean, they, you know, we got to be pretty close. Um, I got to be pretty close with some of these subjects because you're talking about such intimate personal things. And, um, you know, and all of them want their story told not out of pride, but out of because they want people to understand what they're going through and they want others, other wounded people to know, you know, it's going to be all right. What grade would you give, to start with the U.S. government, uh, politicians, and the American people when it comes to taking care of these people that have come close to losing their life uh, and the kind of treatment they get for the rest of their lives? In okay, the let's start with the government. I think I'd give them a B um, because so much of the care that I saw is so, so good. I mean, just, you know, technically, good, um, but also the people that work in the military hospitals, in the VA system, could easily find better jobs, better paying jobs elsewhere, but they're working there because they really care. And I, it sounds like a cliche, but it's so true. If you go to the amputee center, for example, for example, at Walter Reed, the people who work there are just 
the absolute best. At the same time, um, you know, there are gaps in what the government does. There are gaps in what it can do. There are a lot of veterans who don't get reached. Um, the VA cannot compel a veteran to come in for treatment, so, uh, so there are gaps. Politicians, um, I think it's awfully easy to be laudatory about wounded warriors, and there's a lot of great rhetoric. I think it's harder for an individual politician to connect in and get something done. I know a lot of them go to Walter Reed with no press, no publicity. They just go because it's part of what they see as their, their duty, and I think that's great. Um, the American public, I find, is enormously sympathetic toward wounded warriors, but they don't know what to do or how to behave. And so, again, the thing that I learned from knowing so many of these wounded people is go ask what happened. Say, thank you for your service. Welcome home. Can I ask what happened? You know, because they want to talk. One more piece of video from a ye 10 years after 1988 at the National Press Club. In the words of his editors, David is a, quote, muddy boot reporter, much more comfortable sleeping in the rain with the grunts than going to a Pentagon briefing, end quote. You should know, Dave, that that's not all she said. She added that in seven years as your editor, she has never gotten a call from anyone contesting the facts or challenging your analysis. Frankly, I'm very envious. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm beginning to think I'm in the wrong profession. Dave, I'm delighted and honored to present to you the Ford Prize for Distinguished Reporting on National Defense. Will you come forward, please? Is there anything wrong uh, with a former president giving out awards, and is there a chance you get too close to uh, the politics? Oh, heck no. I, no I, think, <laughs> I think it's fine. You know, um, it was quite an honor to get that, f be recognized by former President Ford. And um, um, when, I, when I gave my little acceptance remarks, I said, actually, it's not true that I'm more comfortable sleeping in the rain. I don't like sleeping in the rain, but I've done it a lot. You going to go to war again? I don't know. You know, I'm 67 years old. I'm starting to be more cognizant of all the danger I've been in for most of my career and what I put my family through. It's very hard for them. And I'm not sure I'm willing to do that anymore. And there's so much good reporting to be done here uh, about veterans and, and sort of what they're going through. So I think I'm home for a while. So again, I uh, help the audience if they want to read your whole report. Uh, it's an e-book. can be bought, what, through iTunes or uh, Amazon? Or it's on Amazon. And, um, I, you know, the easiest way to do it is to go to the Huffington Post website and search for Beyond the Battlefield. Or Dave Wood. Or Dave Wood. David Wood. People call you David, not Dave. Whichever. But on the website, it's David. By the way, are you still a conscientious objector or are you still a Quaker? I'm a birthright Quaker, so I'll always be a birthright Quaker. I was recently baptized as Episcopalian. Um, and I'm still, I'm, let's say I'm a seasoned conscientious objector. A uh, seasoned pacifist because I've seen so much of war. I don't see. I don't see a lot of good coming out of war. It's enormously destructive for the people who are in it, to people who are hurt by it. I've never seen a war that really solved a social issue. At the same time, you know there are I individual acts of incredible valor and sacrifice and love that happen in war that make it a fascinating thing for an outsider to watch. But I'd be happy if there was no more war. David Wood, thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. What, a, what an honor to be here.
a DVD copy of this program, call 1-877-662-7726. For free transcripts or to give us your comments about this program, visit us at qna.org. Q&A programs are also available as C-SPAN podcasts.